Coming up on this episode of Out and About Art, we're learning about the Arts and Medicine program at the Watson Clinic Cancer and Research Center, having a chat with local artist Sharon Surrency, and attending the Central Florida Shape Note Music Learn and Sing event at the Polk County History Center. Welcome to Out and About Art, your PGTV source for all things art in Pope County. I'm your host, Jasmine Ali. Arts and Medicine is a nationwide movement that integrates all forms of expressive arts into healthcare settings in order to provide creative outlets for patients, caregivers, and staff. The Arts and Medicine program at the Watson Clinic Cancer and Research Center offers a full range of creative activities that provide encouragement and comfort during a challenging time. Let's take a look. Arts and Medicine is about incorporating the creative arts into a healthcare setting in order to improve medical outcomes. And so my uh, role here is to organize uh, the program into three different components. And those components are the environmental aesthetics or our artwork, which we have a collection of art that will rotate around the center. And then also we have uh, live musical performances. Music instantly changes the environment in the Cancer Center. It is uh, rewarding to anyone who enters, for the staff, to the patients. We've had people who volunteer to play the guitar. We have volunteer, we've had a harpist, we've had somebody um, who plays obviously the piano. We have a beautiful baby grand piano. We've had people that will come in and sing for us. And the way that the Cancer Center is designed, it's in, as a loft. So the music, even though it's played downstairs, it, it fills the whole building. And it's such a treat uh, for everyone who's here. So we always love to have volunteer musicians. And then also we have our studio where we offer creative activities. And the premise behind that is when we're able to get a patient or a caregiver to refocus their thoughts, it then stops the mind from the perhaps chronic uh, worry pattern. And when they refocus, then the body's automatic relaxation response can kick in and the person is able then to relax and to calm down. And what it does actually is it resets the body's um, immune response system and they sometimes refer to that as the remembered wellness. When the body is able to reset then they are able to get back to what the body wants to do and, and to bring itself back to a wholeness. And so arts and medicine is about helping individuals to to refocus and be able to get back to a state of wholeness. We've recently started using a participant survey for the purposes of finding out what type of a difference we were making here at the Watson Clinic Cancer Center. And the feedback has been phenomenal. People were asking on our survey how their pain is, how their anxiety is, uh, how their mood uh, was and is prior to the activity then and after the activity. And consistently, we're seeing improved states in all of those things from the time they've sat down and started the activity to the time they've finished. We're also asking them, would they recommend this activity? Would they continue doing this activity at home? And in all of those uh, questions, they are at answering very positively that it has really made a difference. And another thing that the activities do for them is it creates a sense of community where they can come and they can relate to people who are going through similar journeys. But also what it does is it takes away um, perhaps that diagnosis and when they're sitting at that table, they're just like anybody else. It's not about the cancer, it's just about a couple people sitting down, having coffee, enjoying some type of creative arts activity. Our volunteers that we're looking for are really people who are looking 
to just interact with people. Uh, the most important thing that we can often do is just be a listening board to people, to be encouraging, or to simply sit with them and allow them to just enjoy a, a moment, a break in time to kind of refocus and relax. My name is Sarah Hesson, um, and I've been a volunteer for about a year now. Right when I started, um, it was pretty hard for me to kind of see everything that they were going through. Um, but the more and more I got used to it, I was just like, I am here to give them a little happiness in their day. Um, so that really affected me because now I come here looking forward to not just doing art projects, but also getting to see people that I now recognize. Um, and it's just nice to like see that we are strangers, but if you just sit and do a little art project together or talk a little bit, um, you just have so much in common and it's nice to give them a little bit of time where they don't have to think about anything else going on. Um, so for me it was like I came in looking to just kind of do art, but now it's really nice after doing it for some time to form relationships with some people that you see often or that come in and just tell you how much they really appreciate you. So I actually have heard of some people saying like, oh I would love to volunteer but I don't think I could be in that hard of a situation. Um, and what I would say is it's really not hard <laughs> um, because what the patients are going through is much harder. So if they can do it, then you definitely can do it. Um, right when I started, I had no experience with cancer really at all. I had probably like one friend who had gone through cancer. But other than that, the first when I first came here, it was my first time going through the chemo room. So that was pretty hard at first, but um, you just have to know that like what you're doing really helps them and that's kind of the best way to be able to deal with any hardness that it is for you. My name is Bruni Gautier and I became a patient in 2015. I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and then in 2017 I returned back with liver cancer. In 2015 um, with the diagnosis of ovarian cancer, I was devastated, absolutely. And it devastates your family also. So I remember Eva Hawkins coming in and just giving me the smile and she would bring like pencils and arts and, and I'm not an artsy person, I'm a social worker. My career is a social worker and so I'm not into the arts but when I started to do the coloring, I was amazed at how less the stress was. I was so grateful for her. And then again, her, um, the, her volunteers would pass by and would say, you, do you want some chocolate? Can I put a blanket on you? They were so amazing. They were so congenial. It just made my five hours here easier. And it also helped my daughter, who was also impacted by this, by seeing how kind they were to me. So I just, it, I, I got into the program. I said, whenever I get better, I'm going to, um, go to where the studio is and I'm going to look at th this art because I've never been into arts. And the, the beautiful part is that honestly I never thought I had any kind of skills when it comes to art. And Eva was so patient with me and her uh, volunteers were so amazing. They would teach me and if I would make a mistake they would say that's okay. So it built up my confidence that I was able to do this. And the time that I would spend with the arts and medicine was so valuable to me. I would leave here going, I could make it. I could, I could, I could fight this because Eva's here and her volunteers are here and they're rooting for me. So that rooting for me made such an impact in my life, both times that I've come in. I was diagnosed in 2010 and went through the whole gamut of treatment, chemo, radiation, and I was going to my support group. And seven years ago, the gal that was then coordinator was new, and she attended our support group trying to recruit volunteers. I'm a crafter. And when she explained what the program was, right up my alley. So with the blessing of my husband and a lot of friends saying, go for it, I signed up to be a volunteer. I tell them over and over, it's easy. If I can do it, you can do it, because I do not believe in making anything that's hard. And that's exactly the way I feel. 
Uh, sometimes, uh, just an example, last week when I was here, we were doing button art, like these over here, and they would come up and look at it, and I said, okay, you're here. I want you to pick out a button and show me where you want it put, and I'll put it. And I had several that did that. And sometimes they, they come back, uh, you know, look at something that we've been doing, and they go, oh, I did some of that. And our wall of CD weaving there, you cannot believe how many people come up and say, I did some of those. So they take pride when they do do things. I retired from Watson Clinic. I've been a patient here, so Watson Clinic is like home. And this volunteer program is my way of paying back. For more information on the arts and medicine program at the Watson Clinic Cancer and Research Center, and to find out how to volunteer, visit www.watsonclinic.com forward slash AIM. This month, our spotlight lands on local artist Sharon Surrency. She arrived in Florida back in 1978 and has been participating in the local art scene ever since. Sharon enjoys watercolor painting because it involves an element of risk that you can't get from any other type of art. Here's a look at the artwork of Sharon Cernsey. I'm Sharon Cernsey. Um, my hometown is Festus, Missouri. Came to Florida back in 78. And uh, I've just always been in the arts in one way or another. Now I'm from the generation where an art degree really had little value. So uh, I did go to college, full scholarships, uh, and received two degrees in education. But I guess when art's in your blood, it just follows you through life. It, you know, it just twines in and out. I come from the Midwest. We were outside a lot. Uh, when I raised my family, they were boys. They loved camping. So we spent a lot of time out in nature. And when we did that, I usually took my uh, uh, painting supplies with me and did little quick sketches and that sort of thing. So I guess it just, you know, became my repertoire. I have a studio in my home and I go into the studio and create as often as I can. So is it every day? Not necessarily, but it's enough to keep me motivated and to keep my uh, skills moving. And as every artist always says, you know, we always want to become more dedicated and more, uh, more creative. And, and uh, so that's kind of where I'm at right now. Whenever I create a watercolor, I have to have a sense of first self-expression. But I want that element of risk. I want to allow the watercolor to, it's a free spirit. And if you give it rain, it will surprise you in so many ways. Now, what does that mean? That means that not every watercolor is going to be, you know, a frameable masterpiece. However, it's the process. Creativity and dedication go hand in hand. Um, sitting around waiting for the muse to come and tap you on the shoulder, you know, not so much. Uh, and get in, your, get in the studio, you know, and start painting and creativity and innovation and all of that comes to you. And watercolor just exemplifies all of that. Uh, I do do acrylics occasionally, and uh, they're fun, uh, but not the same as watercolor. And when you drop that pigment into water, or you drop pigments into other pigments, the mingling, uh, the excitement that it creates, you can't get that with other media. So the process really starts in your mind. You like that little photograph there. You know, I keep going past it and past it, and I did paint it decades ago, and still it comes back to you. 
you know, you sketch it out real fast. You, and that's the important thing, you do sketch it out. I probably spend more time on the drawing, at least as much time, if not more time, on the drawing than I do on the painting. You've got a reference. Most people use references. Some don't, but most people do. And at some point in the painting, you kind of forget about it. And the painting takes on its own life, and it tells you where to go. So each brush stroke toward the end has definite meaning. Sometimes, some uh, painting sessions, you're kind of fighting the elements, so to speak. But then there's those times whenever it just flows. And you're in, you know, you're kind of right-brained, you're in the flow, everything just kind of moves together. You're not really thinking, you are just doing. And everything that you've learned, that's why I tell people who come in for classes, is to get that framework of knowledge because then whenever you get in the flow, it's there for you, you know, and whenever you have that need to create, it's there. All the tools are there and, and it just kind of flows. I love the work of Mary Cassett, read her biographies uh, every time I get an opportunity to see her work in a museum. Uh, her line just takes the viewer, just, just takes them on a journey through her compositions. They're, it's just beautiful and her form, um, the softness of her color palette, uh, it just, you know, uh, it just draws me to her work. I've always been involved in women's uh, movements and so forth, and one comment that Degas made to her, which always stayed with me, uh, was that um, he saw one of her pieces and said, this is perfect. Women can't paint like that. Well, make a long story short, he ended up purchasing that piece of artwork. But yeah, women through the ages, uh, Mary Cassett, George O'Keefe, Lee Krasner, uh, married to Jackson Pollock. You know, just, uh, I, I read a lot of their biographies and very, very insp inspirational to me. I spent, you know, over 20 years in the classroom and the arts encompasses everything. Uh, but it does more than that. The arts gets into the, the spirit, the soul of, of people and you know it can make them get outside of themselves and uh, that journey of self-expression is just so important. But taking a, another tangent and uh, education of the arts uh, I just think it's so important for society. Um, we get a little frustrated in the arts because there's always money for sports and parks and so forth and so on, but you know, maybe an art center, uh, maybe not so much. That's, uh, that to me is just as important to society, if not more so, uh, than some of the other things that uh, society tends to focus on. I think the art scene, uh, local art scenes, have their ebb and flow. And uh, when I came here back in 78, it was booming. Oh, we had, we had incredible artists in the area. And uh, in fact, I mean, they, you know, like I said, we all go on, on <laughs> headwinds and tailwinds. And a group of very accomplished artists uh, embraced me and I joined the group back then. Uh, we showed together, and uh, then my husband started uh, Arts in the Park uh, back then, and that was just a great experience. And then we kind of had a lull, you know, just kind of a lull. And then the past five or six years, just, you know, the new generations are just coming up with so many different areas of art. Uh, not just the, uh, as, they, as some of the young people call us, old school, <laughs> but uh, some, some really exciting things happening in Polk County. And um, so uh, it, it, it is, it's, it's an exciting time. Get involved and check out a variety of different classes offered at the Meraki Artists Resource Center by visiting www.the-mark.com. For our last segment this month, we're getting a crash course on the musical style known as Shape Note Singing. 
Shape Note singing has entertained communities and fellowship gatherings for generations without the use of a single instrument other than the human voice. Let's listen to this unique style of music, which was showcased at the Polk County History Center last month. My name is Rachel Spear. I live in the Orlando area, uh, and I'm excited to be here in Bartow for the uh, Shape Note singing, uh, Sing and Learn, I think they're calling it. I started singing Shape Note music in the fall of 2001, uh, when I started college. I had a friend who had grown up singing Shape Note music, and uh, told me that there was a singing uh, just in the next town over every Tuesday night and so I was kind of curious because I had grown up singing in church choirs and I'd never heard of shape note music and so I went and I was just immediately hooked. Uh, there were about 40 people, um, a mix of college students and people of all ages uh, who were singing these hymns in four-part harmony really loudly and some songs were slow and some songs were fast but there was always a lot of energy in the room and it just seemed like really fun <laughs> and uh, I kept doing it throughout college and I was delighted to learn that there's shape note singing all over the country and in fact now all over the world and so uh, whenever I moved to a new place uh, I would just you know find the local shape note scene there <laughs> and um, I think that when I first started singing Shape Notes, what appealed to me about it was the music. I knew, I recognized a couple of the songs from, you know, church hymns and also from a recording I'd heard of the Boston Camerata uh, performing early American hymns. And so throughout college, I think that singing was sort of my weird hobby. And it was only after I left college um, and started to go to singings in Virginia and Baltimore and saw there that. Uh, that singing really was a community, not just an activity that people got together to do together, but that the people who came regularly were really friends with one another and uh, were sort of um, not just hosting events, but uh, building a community. And that really appealed to me. I think for some people, sacred harp singing becomes almost a substitute for a religious community. Uh, because we have a lot of the familiar elements of singing hymns, praying together, eating together, <laughs> socializing after the singings. Um, but one thing that's nice about Sacred Harp singing is that everybody is welcome. You're welcome regardless of whether you have any musical training or skill or talent. Um, even if you're always flat, that's okay. If you are here and you're singing and you're having a good time, we're glad that you're here and we love to sit next to you and sing with you. Um, it's open to everybody regardless of religious affiliation or lack thereof. Uh, some people will say that we leave our religion and our politics at the door when we walk into a singing. Um, for some people, it's a very meaningful form of worship. Um, and for other people, it's a very meaningful form of community building. Um, and for a lot of people, it's, it's many things all at the same time wrapped into one nice package. So um, I think that I've been very fortunate to be able to sing in a lot of different places with different people. And I think it's fun that you can travel anywhere with a Sacred Heart book and immediately have a community to plug yourself into and people who are happy to see you and happy to host you in their house and happy to feed you and uh, happy that you're there to sing with them. So shape note singing refers to a style of singing that uses a particular kind of musical notation. The musical notation is just like regular standard Western musical notation that you would see in any church hymnal, except instead of all of the note heads being round circles, the note heads have different shapes which indicate the notes place on the scale. So uh, the most popular form of shape notes uses a four shape notation which corresponds to a four syllable solfege. So our, our major scale goes fa, sol, la, fa, sol, la, mi, fa. So there are four different syllables and they have four different shapes that correlate to those syllables. There's, um, there's also seven shape notation systems which use the do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do scale and so each of those syllables has a unique shape that corresponds to it. And the shapes are really intended to be a sight reading tool. So they were developed around 1800 uh, as a way to help people who did not have specific musical training be able to sight read music and to sing together in four part harmony uh, to sort of improve the quality of congregational singing or to allow people to get together and sing hymns outside of church. 
and um, a number of different note systems were uh, developed and published. Uh, a number of different uh, uh, songbooks were published, different collections by different compilers. Um, so there's a great rich history of uh, songbooks that were published, you know, in New England, in the Mid-Atlantic, in the South, um, really all throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. So there's, there's sort of a rich history of people um, writing songs, compiling books, publishing the books, and then the book that really got the most traction historically was The Sacred Harp, which was originally published by B.F. White in 1844. Um, and then, you know, one of the fun things about the Sacred Harp community, the shape note singing community more broadly, is that it's a living tradition. It's not just that we're reenacting some historical way of singing together. We are getting together to sing together because we enjoy doing it, and we are still writing songs. Uh, there's a very active uh, scene of people composing new songs um, in the same style of the old songs uh, for, the, for the most part. Um, and I'm hoping that a lot of those new compositions will get into the new revision of the Sacred Harp um, and there are lots of other opportunities to sing new compositions as well. I think that shape note singing is very important to the people who do it. I think there are some people who are lucky enough to have been born into singing families where their parents sang, their grandparents sang. Um, it's always been an important part of their family, of their church community, of their, um, their, their, their community of friends. I think it, it, it has been an important part of um, particularly rural southern culture over the past several centuries. Um, there were a lot of churches that only had uh, a pastor come to lead a service once a month and so the other Sundays of the month uh, people would get together and sing out of a book like the Sacred Harp. I know that shape note singing has played an important part in the evolution of American sacred music. Um, the shape notes were invented here in the United States. Uh, I think I've heard it said that this is the earliest form of truly American music. Um, and of course they borrowed a lot of tunes and hymn texts from European uh, tr musical traditions. Um, but it was something that really took root uh, you know, it started in New England and took root in the rural South um, with the Great Awakenings um, and became really entwined with American Protestant religion um, throughout lots of different um, denominations. Uh, shape note music was part of camp meetings uh, as part of the Second Great Awakening in the 19th century. Um, and, you know, I think that there are some churches uh, that have used shape note hymnals um, for their congregational worship. And so it's obviously an important part of their religious traditions. Um, and as I said, I think it's just been something that ties people together in community. Um, and it's one of the few opportunities that I can think of in the modern world where people can get together and sing just for the joy of singing together. So it's not like being in a choir where you're rehearsing so that you can get ready for your big performance for an audience. It's just something that you do because you enjoy doing it and you enjoy getting together with other people and singing. And I don't know of many other opportunities that we have to do that. I feel like American music, particularly in this day and age, is very performance focused, right? We listen to the radio, we listen to um, these famous artists who have gotten record deals because they are, you know, great performers, great artists. We listen to our our friends sing karaoke where they're again like standing up in front of an audience <laughs> to perform and um, and we go and we hear community concerts which again are performing for an audience so I think for me it's it's been really wonderful to be part of a singing community where we sing for ourselves we sing for one another we sing for um, to worship God we sing for love of the music um, we sing for all these reasons and performing for an audience is not among those reasons. <laughs> um, so I think it's just a different way to connect with music um, and to, to form community bonds than, than sort of other things that we have available to us. For more information about upcoming events at the Polk County History Center, visit www.polk-county.net forward slash history hyphen center. Well, that's all I have for this month, but there's always plenty going on within the Polk County art scene. Stay tuned for a list of art events in your area. Thank you for joining me, and I'll see you next month for more art out and about.